couple minutes um, after 12 o'clock, we will start um, with our event. Um, there will be probably more people um, joining us as we go along. So um, let me introduce myself. I'm Emily Westhofen, the Executive Director of the German American Business Council of Boston. And I welcome all of you um, to today's virtual event on an apprenticeship model in the tech field, um, specifically adapted here for Massachusetts. Um, the German American Business Council, or GABC, here in Boston is a membership-based organization bringing together and promoting exchange between German and American businesses, as well as business people, and sharing ideas, um, as we are actually doing today. Um, we are a network organization, having shifted a little bit as these times require into the virtual format, um, and it is therefore my pleasure to host this event here today. Um, before we start and go officially into the program, I would like to acknowledge that it is September 11th today, um, a day that I have personally witnessed uh, myself here already in the US 19 years ago and certainly left a huge mark um, on this country and on the world actually for that matter. So please join me in remembering those who lost their lives through this tragedy, whether that was in one of the towers, in one of the planes, the Pentagon, and all those who lost their lives while helping to save lives 19 years ago. So thank you for that moment. Uh, I know we all look back to, to that day 19 years ago. So as the German American Business Council, we are very pleased um, to bring this informational um, presentation and discussion to you today. As many of you know, um, Germany's apprenticeship model has been praised as a pathway to a career that combines training on the job with additional education, leading to a respected and most importantly recognized certification in their respective fields. And I won't go into the details of how this works in Germany and um, advantages versus disadvantages, but I would like to mention that our friends at the German American Chamber of Commerce in New York also support and develop um, sustainable skills development programs in the US based on the German model and feel free to reach out to them directly um, for further information or contact me um, to have me connect um, you with them. But a few weeks ago, we were approached by Rainer Gatlik um, on a model that has been developed in the US and has been adapted here specifically for Massachusetts and currently geared towards the tech talents. Um, we had not heard of this model before and we were very intrigued and are therefore very pleased to be able to bring you today's program. As to our agenda, agenda today, um, Aina Gavlik will set the scene for us, um, the context and the model. Um, Lauren Jones, the director of the Apprentice program, will explain how it works um, with the presentation. And a little later, we are looking forward um, that Jim Chilton will join the conversation. He is the CIO of Cengage, a very large global education and technology company based here in Boston, um, who has taken time out of his busy day to talk about how and why he introduced this program into the company. Now, while you've been busy filling out the poll, I just a few other technical reminders for our format here on Zoom today. Um, we recommend that once we're off um, the screen share that um, you will view us in speaker view, so you will see the speakers talk. Um, you're automatically muted. Um, you can actually choose to be with your video on or off. Um, if you have questions throughout the program, please um, submit them in the chat function, um, probably below on your computer screen. And I also want to point out, since we're missing the networking that we have in person for those who don't know, um, if you actually want to chat with one person that you see attending the event um, today, you can actually go on that particular little video screen. On the top of that screen, you will see three little dots and you will see the um, um, opportunity to actually chat with uh, or reach to, out to somebody in specific. Um, the event will be recorded in speaker view um, and made available on our YouTube channel, hopefully um, later today. So without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to um, welcome Rainer Gavlik, um, the chair of the Massachusetts Apprentice Advisory Board. Um, Rainer is a successful tech executive um, who is now active in the area of workforce development as the chair of the Massachusetts Apprentice Advisory Board 
and as a member of the Mass Higher State Workforce Board, where he co-chairs the Adult Pathways Committee for the Mass Higher State Workforce Board. He's held executive sales and marketing positions at a broad range of technology companies, including Aspen Tech, Lightship Telecom, SolidWorks, Sophos, and Intralinks. Uh, most recently, he was president of Perfecto Mobile. He's on the board of several technology companies, including Protolabs and Progress. He started his career at McKinsey after earning a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. He was born in Germany and he is still fluent in German. Um, I can certainly attest to that. So with further ado, I will um, give the mic um, to Rainer and welcome very much. Thank, thank you, Emily. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction and the opportunity uh, to speak to, to your membership. I just want to do a quick a uh, scene setting comment before I hand over the uh, uh, book of the presentation uh, to Lauren. Uh, I assume most of you are, are familiar with the apprenticeship model that Emily spoke to and the benefits that it provides to both the students, uh, the companies that get opportunity to use these apprenticeships and educate them and the society as a whole because it provides another pathway for people to get into very high paying and often uh, jobs that lead to great careers. The state of Massachusetts recognized the benefits of the system a few years ago and two years ago adapt, um, developed a strategic plan to expand apprenticeships uh, in Massachusetts into three areas where they haven't been used in the past. One is high tech, the other is uh, healthcare, and the final one is advanced manufacturing. Uh, now, naturally, even though the German model served as a inspiration for this expansion of apprenticeships into Massachusetts, you can't generally do a copy paste. Uh, you have to recognize the cultural context and institutional context of the society in which you're trying to uh, use the con uh, concept. And so what we've done here with the apprentice work that Lauren will introduce is in the context of tech uh, and tech jobs, uh, taking the German concept and adapted it to the US uh, social and institutional context. So with that uh, quick introduction, I'd like to introduce uh, Lauren Jones. Uh, Lauren is the executive director of uh, the Apprentice Organization in Massachusetts, which is an organization that actually is active in 15 uh, states in the United States. Lauren has a, a very extensive uh, track record in uh, workforce development and in private um, gov and government uh, private partnerships uh, to better the economy of, of Massachusetts. So with that uh, very quick introduction, uh, let me hand the floor to uh, Lauren Jones. Thank you, Reiner, and thank you, Emily, and the council for hosting today's event. Um, I'm sharing my screen with everybody, and I'll walk through a very brief presentation to introduce you to Apprenti um, in Massachusetts, but also underscore some of the points that Reiner um, alluded to as it relates to the value of apprenticeship. Um, I think what's probably most um, important to Apprenti and we think about apprenticeships here in the United States is why apprenticeship. Um, so before even diving into that, I think it's first important to recognize um, the tech talent shortage that we're seeing in the United States. And I know uh, a good portion of the uh, participants recognize that they have been part of conversations in the past several months um, as it relates to uh, talent, um, tech talent, whether that's retention um, in these times that we're in, development, um, or, um, or just uh, growth of our, your tech talent. And that's really not a surprise, considering that across the country, uh, there's nearly a million jobs that are posted yet unfilled. And so Apprenti uh, recognized this shortage about five years ago when we were founded in Seattle, Washington to help address this tech talent shortage, but also create a model that can use, be useful for the industry to close the um, diversity gaps as well. So I will um, just dive in with a few um, highlights about why apprenticeship. Um, I think there's a value add for both job seekers as well as employers, and we at Apprenti certainly appreciate this. Uh, for job seekers, an apprenticeship really adds um, an attractive value proposition because there's a promise of a job. 
followed or as part of the, that, it's including the training. So with Apprenti, our model is actually upfront technical training followed by one year of employment at a sponsoring um, company. And that's a huge value add for someone that's been trying to get into tech, but really hasn't found that pathway uh, to pursue a career. Uh, it's also financially viable. Um, given the employer support um, of the model, as well as in Massachusetts government support too, where they're not having to pay out of pocket to pursue a career, um, rather companies are investing in them and um, a lot cheaper approach than pursuing a boot camp or a college pathway. And with that, for the job seeker, it's really a clear and pretty objective path for a pursuit in apprenticeship. For Apprenti, that's a very clear model with knowing the IT occupation they're gonna pursue and the wage progression that would come with a role like a software developer apprentice, continuing on um, with a career as a software developer. On the other side of the coin is the employer um, with tremendous benefits for a company who's embracing the apprenticeship model to really think in new ways of how they develop their talent and also retention of their employees. And you'll hear later um, from Jim Shilton, the CIO of Cengage, to really elaborate on his own experience in, um, as an employer and a decision maker in adapting um, an apprenticeship model with Cengage. Um, but for employers, they're able to be at the table um, helping to inform the skills of their employees, the apprentices who are actually on the job. Um, they're finding that apprenticeships open up new um, pipelines for diverse talent. With Apprenti, um, we especially aim to bring in more women, people of color, and veterans into our pipelines. Um, so we're seeing a tremendous growth in that for, for tech. And employers also see a benefit because apprentices are very loyal. They, they recognize that companies are investing in their, their growth. And so there's a greater return on investment um, as those apprentices continue in their careers, hopefully with that employer beyond the apprenticeship. And lastly, I think as companies are realizing apprenticeship is a true investment in their talent, it really helps to either create a culture of training and investment in their workforce, or even building on that culture that may already exist within a company. So what does apprenticeship deliver? Um, I'll speak to this um, highlighting apprenticeship, but more specifically apprentice model as well. Um, so an apprenticeship, um, provides really a standardization um, with job classifications and the technical training that comes with those jobs. So Apprenti has a menu of IT occupations, which I'll speak to in the next slide. And with each occupation, you know the credentials, the industry credentials, the certifications and the competencies that would come with each job classification that we're helping to fulfill. The apprenticeship model also provides vetted and pre-screened candidates. Um, for Apprenti, we work locally, so here in Massachusetts, to fill our talent pipeline. Um, we're especially working with local um, community-based organizations and workforce development organizations that are closest to job seekers looking for alternative career pathways. And so through that, we're able to build a strong pipeline of um, diverse candidates, especially, that are pursuing, ready to pursue a career. We're really looking for individuals at this stage who have not only successfully passed our online assessment that measures for math, critical thinking and logic, and as well as soft skills, but also through conversations and screening that we do, looking for that right aptitude and attitude to be um, successful in pursuing a career in tech. The apprenticeship model also provides a discounted wage rate. So um, because our apprenticeship model for Apprenti, um, as well as registered apprenticeships in general are um, sponsored by, um, or are, are, are within standards of the US Department of Labor and here in Massachusetts, the Division of Apprentice Standards, um, we file our standards to ensure that we can really apply this learn and earn model. So individuals are learning on the job and as a result, they are going to have um, pay um, and be a regular employee, but at a discounted wage rate, really providing upfront savings to you as the employer. And over time, their wage will continue to increase as their skill increases. Um, the apprenticeship model provides um, 
really occupations that are applicable across industries. And so we in Massachusetts, as well as Apprenti across the country, um, are able to work with companies not only in high tech, but healthcare, financial services, and as you'll hear from Cengage, an ed tech company. Um, and we are able to really take these IT occupations that may be relevant in a tech company, but also relevant in any company that has a growing um, IT department. And we're always asking for feedback from employers. We wanna make sure that we are staying nimble and meeting the needs of the companies that we work with, as well as the industry that we continue to serve. So here's a snapshot of the IT occupations that Apprenti delivers. Um, we looked at entry level um, opportunities that were really middle skilled, opportunities for um, this in-depth training with upfront technical training, followed by on the job training, um, where it didn't necessarily require a four year degree to be successful. And so you'll see a menu of about 10 occupations that we deliver. And within each of these occupations, there are very objective um, milestones or competencies that an apprentice will gain either in technical training upfront or during their one year of on the job training. So for example, a cybersecurity analyst in their three months of upfront technical training will pass the CompTIA Network Plus certification before going on to the job. And over the course of their 12 month experience um, at a company, they will then gain um, further knowledge and work-based learning to then be competent enough to take the CompTIA Security Plus exam, as well as either a pen test plus exam or CEH, depending on the curriculum that we've developed for the employer. Um, likewise, our IT business analyst um, is another popular occupation here in Massachusetts. There are some basics um, in business that are gained during that technical training, but they're also coming into the door day one of on-the-job training with exposure and experience in SQL, Tableau, Microsoft Power BI, um, and all of that is understood by the employer um, before they welcome the apprentice onto the job. So how does our program work? I'll just want, run through a few highlights um, to give you a sense of how we are delivering this program in Massachusetts, as well as the markets we serve across the country. So I mentioned we aim to bring in more diversity in tech. And so we are especially trying to attract women, people of color, and veterans into our pipeline. So here locally, we're often recruiting and working with organizations like the Urban League, She Geeks Out, Veteran Groups, uh, JVS, Goodwill. And as a result, we have um, a strong pipeline of candidates that have passed our online assessment, demonstrating an aptitude in math, critical thinking, and lo um, logic, as well as soft skills. And they're ready to um, and eager to pursue a career in tech. Um, as part of our process, we will screen these candidates in two rounds of interviews, but it's ultimately the employer that then um, interviews candidates that we recommend to them based on what we understand they're looking for. And they select the apprentice or the apprentices. They actually provide an offer letter and the offer letter articulates that they will extend a job opportunity through the apprenticeship for one year um, following the successful passage of their upfront technical training. And so that's kind of a golden ticket for apprentices going through technical training, knowing there's this promise of a job waiting for them afterwards. The apprentice then goes into technical training that may be anywhere from three to five months before going on to the job or OJT for 12 months. That is a 12 month, one year paid and supervised experience for the apprentice. Um, we're working with employers to make sure that they're delivering a, a scope of work um, to help the apprentice gain um, further skills as, say, a software developer or a cybersecurity analyst. And there's a lot of um, development with that supervisor-apprentice relationship, that master passing on the knowledge to the apprentice during that um, um, experience. And over time, the apprentice will gain um, greater productivity and skill um, over the course of the 12, um, 12 months. And the hope is that at the end of all of this, the reason why a company's even raising their hand to begin with is to hopefully convert the apprentice at the end of the apprenticeship. 
And as part of our program model, um, our apprentices can be converted as early as six months onto the job, um, but often our apprentices complete the full 12 months and are extended opportunities for employment. Um, both nationally as well as here in Massachusetts, we're seeing conversion rates um, of over 80% of our apprentices that are um, completing um, their um, on-the-job training and staying with their sponsoring employer and even greater rates, close to 85%, where they're landing jobs within the industry if they aren't extending an offer by their sponsoring employer. So here in Massachusetts, we're really thankful for um, our hiring partners that we have to date, but we're also looking forward to continuing to extend um, partnerships, not only in greater Boston, where you may see we have the bulk of our partnerships, but also serving across the, co the Commonwealth. Um, I mentioned you'll hear from Jim at Cengage. Uh, Cengage is one of our founding um, hiring partners here in Massachusetts, and we're really excited because other, uh, but for these companies opening their doors for apprentices, we really wouldn't have a program. Um, these companies are reimagining how they're finding talent and expanding um, solutions for finding tech talent and using the apprenticeship model to really be that pathway for new talent and, and a pipeline for them as well. So just a quick snapshot of what the benefits are for you as the employer and the commitments that you have to make. Um, we've talked about this um, at the start, um, but really the benefits, you're able to work with a class of um, employees, apprentices um, who are protected. So you're able to provide that discounted wage rate. You are really creating this um, work-based learning experience. Um, you're investing in your talent um, through this apprenticeship um, uh, class that is really a, a benefit for you to um, further invest and train your, your own employees. You are having access to these pre-screened um, candidates that I've mentioned before. You know they're gonna gain the upfront technical training prior to coming onto the job. And you can look to Apprenti to be that um, link, understanding the needs that you as the employer are looking for, but also working with the applicant pool, our training providers, and um, state and federal government to ensure we're maintaining all the uh, appropriate filings as an apprenticeship program. Um, you're committing to 12 months of the apprenticeship program. You know that you're gonna identify supervisors who can be a resource to your apprentices who are really passing on that knowledge to the apprentice and working with them to gain that apprenticeable scope of work over the course of their time. And you also measure their performance. Um, there will be an understanding on both the apprentice's side as well as you as the employer on how they should be performing and re reaching certain milestones. Um, and we do that at month two, five, and 10 along the way. And lastly, we, we add in a buffer or, or, or a probationary period to really make sure that um, the apprentices are um, transitioning appropriately and the experience is what you are looking for. And if there is a need to intervene to make sure that there's some transition or better transition from technical training, we have that probation period to really allow for that to benefit both you as the employer as well as the apprentice. Um, lastly, again, I've mentioned this before, but the apprenticeship model in general, as well as what we do through apprentices to help companies invest and prepare your workforce. Um, we're really fortunate in Massachusetts to have support from the Baker administration to help offset the technical training cost, but it is a shared cost model with our employers. And so you're choosing to um, invest in the apprentices technical training in that classroom setting, um, but the state has offered a $5,000 grant to help immediately reduce that cost and we manage that grant so you don't have to even worry about it. And there's also a $4,800 investment tax credit for eligible employers to claim um, once the apprentice is on the job. So we really have a good ecosystem and climate here in Massachusetts to support registered apprenticeship. We're collaborating with you and vice versa. You're getting the benefit of um, the program that we're managing really for you. And so as a result, there is a placement fee that Apprenti um, looks for with each of our apprentices, but in turn, you know that you're getting these vetted and recommended candidates as well as all the management that we'll do. And that's a $2,500 placement fee per apprentice. Um, we will work with you um, leading up to on-the-job training as well as 
throughout the on-the-job training experience to ensure that your apprentices are on board it and support it um, and, and that there's that discounted wage rate that you know. So rather than paying someone entry level at $100,000 for a software developer, you're able to benefit from paying that 60% reduced uh, wage rate uh, and gaining those savings while you're, you're training um, those uh, early on, on apprentices. So really a savings for you as you're making this investment. And lastly, um, because we know that our apprentices are diving into this experience in the technical training, we um, recommend, but it's, it's not part of our requirements of our program, for companies that are interested in providing a stipend during the apprentice's technical training. And that really allows for the apprentice to stay heads down, focus on the upfront technical training to ensure their success once they come onto the job. Um, I'm leaving here with my contact information, but I, I know that the conversation is going to continue really with uh, Reiner and Jim uh, really adding some illustration as to why apprentice, why apprenticeship uh, from an employer's perspective. So at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Reiner um, to continue with that conversation. Great. Thank, thank you, Lauren. Um, so uh, hopefully that, that very brief overview uh, was, was helpful, but we thought even more important uh, than the overviews to get the perspective of an employer uh, who is um, you know partaking in the program has uh, brought a number of apprentices on board and for that purpose I've got uh, Jim Chilton here uh, who is the CIO at, at Cengage. Uh, Cengage is a uh, ed tech company it's one of the leaders in uh, providing education materials uh, and particularly given the current circumstance, increasingly providing those materials uh, online to students um, as, as they navigate the, the new educational world. Uh, Jim, as a CIO, has been quite busy uh, making, making sure that actually happens seamlessly. Uh, this is not uh, Jim's first time uh, to the CIO job. He's, he's got five of those uh, assignments under his belt at this point. Uh, and he's also an advisor to uh, a number of uh, well-known startups uh, in the Boston area uh, as well. Finally, Jim uh, just recently won the Orbi Award, which is a, a, a organization of CIOs that uh, looks at their uh, you know, membership organization and uh, is, was awarded by his peers as the CIO of the year, uh, which uh, obviously we're all very happy to see, but are, are not surprised. <laughs> so... With, with that introduction, uh, let me, I said, welcome, Jim. And I've got a couple of questions that I prepared that I wanted to talk through with Jim that may help uh, everyone here get a bit of context around apprenticeships, particularly from a US-based employer, uh, since for a US-based employer, this is definitely a new concept. And then afterwards, we'll hopefully have an opportunity for others to ask questions as well. So Jim, let me uh, start with, um, you know, why did you even consider the apprenticeship model, right? I mean, you've been hiring all your life. Uh, you've, had, you've had a lot of ways in which to hire. This is new. Why, why, think of, why consider this new way of hiring? Uh, that, well, first of all, Ryan, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, the kind words. It was uh, super nice. And I am still, uh, still floating on my Orby uh, award. So that is uh, a big deal. And uh, I'm super excited about that still. Um, why apprentice and why now? I mean, I think... For anybody in the Boston-based area, and I think Lauren touched on this, is getting talent here is hard. Getting talent inside of Boston is really hard. Getting talent inside of Boston, when you think about diversity and inclusivity, and then you think about the spirit of the company for which I serve, is about a company that's built for learners and how people can learn, you have to do this. And it's why the reason that I jumped at the opportunity to participate, you know, finding the place where you can get people and actually provide a career path for them. So you take all the challenges that I think many of you must be going through as well of saying, how do you get people in this market? How do you attract them to your company? And more importantly, how do you get them to stay and actually have a career path with you that lasts longer than the project that you're working on. And so I think that for me, this program was super interesting because we could bring in people, some that had some education before, some that didn't, but certainly through this program, they came in with the right skill sets and capabilities to be able to do the job. So I think for me, Reiner, that's, that's what jumped out to me is that 
this was a new funnel to get talent into a company of a new type of resource with a new level of appreciation for the opportunity that I wouldn't get anywhere else. That's great. And that's what I've heard from a lot of folks is that, yeah, that this brings in people that their traditional hiring methods just can't find, right? Which, which exactly. is great. Now, obviously anything new uh, provides potential risks, right? Uh, I think we all know that's so why, why trying new things sometimes feels hard. Uh, what are some of the risks that you perceived uh, before you tried this that, that you were concerned about and how you kind of, how did you manage yourself through those risks? It's, um, <laughs> there certainly is. Um, I, I think that when you look at bringing in people into a company and depending on the companies you work for, it's, there's a lot of red tape. There can be a process. There can be um, certain people have to check certain boxes, certain stamps have to be done. You have to believe in this enough, which I did, to help sell this inside the company. Because you're right, there's risks that go along with this. The benefits I can say now with eight apprentices on board, two of them converted to employees, I can say is real. And so I would encourage you to take that risks. That makes sense. But you will, you'll have doubting Thomases. You will have people that you have to walk through inside the company that says, we don't, we don't do it this way, Jim. You'll put them through the talent and acquisition team. You'll put them through our authorized recruiters. We have a relationship with these colleges. And in our case, I mean, there isn't a higher education institution in this country that we don't serve as a customer. So me walking the hallways of a company that makes a billion dollars a year on the higher education system and saying, I want to implement a program where actually we're not focused on higher education. You can imagine resistance was pretty frequent. Um, so yeah, there's risk to go with it. I think what I would encourage you, again, the satisfaction that you and the people around you get. And it was interesting for me because the big challenges I had were both on the HR side, because like, this is our job. We basically should have come up with this idea. So you shouldn't be bringing it to us. And the legal side that says, you're going to interview and sign up people for something. And I don't know who they are yet. This whole thing I really made, there was a process that was in place and this disrupted that process. What I can say now is that every one of those people that were the doubting Thomases when we started this together, are the very people now that are the single biggest advocates in the company, both inside the company, and outside the company. I've got a couple outside the company that talk about what they've done with the program. And I'm like, wow, this is outstanding. And so um, the best form of flattery is imitation. And so I indeed think that's, that's what's happening there. But I think um, it is worth the risk, but yes, you're going to have to, and particularly those of you that are familiar with this from a European perspective is that it's a paradigm shift. People don't, there's a process here of you do this step, you get this degree, and you're able to do this step. There's something that you're changing in their thinking. You have to be able to carry that story through. Right, great. Thank you. That, that's, yeah, and, and that's, that's, again, an experience that a lot of our employee, uh, high, uh, employee partners have had, employer partners have had, that uh, new things require some work on part of the sponsor to get them comfortable with it. Hopefully some of the companies that have connections to the German model uh, we'll find that a little bit easier. Uh, you've alluded to this uh, a little bit uh, by virtue of the fact that some of the, uh, as you put them, doubting Thomases are now people who are putting this on their CV. Um, how have the apprentices performed for you? It, it suggests that it has, has, has been fa fairly positive, but I'd love to kind of get a little bit more detail on, on how the program has gone and how the apprentices have performed and how they've kind of been able to get uh, work into the culture uh, of the company. Yeah, so it's, they performed remarkably well. And I think the culture, it's really interesting with companies and cultures is that when we were all together in the office, it was so much easier to measure and feel that. We've actually added apprentices post COVID in the Zoom world. And so I think even with that, we've seen great strides in both the candidates capability and readiness upon their arrival but the part that's so interesting and if you ask any one of the apprentices 
they all say the same thing. This was too good to be true. And I don't know about you, I've got a team of about 350 people now. Very few people in the 25 years I've been doing this work have ever looked me in the eyes and said, an opportunity I have given them has been too good to be true. So when you have someone that actually believes that at their core, their dedication, commitment into work and the satisfaction that they're trying to achieve is like nothing I've experienced elsewhere. So you've got people who have worked harder than many to get to a place for an opportunity that they're incredibly grateful for. Their dedication and commitment is really second to none. They're not coming in saying, hey, I could have worked six other places for you. They say that we are grateful that you chose us and gave me this opportunity. So there's a, a component to this that's immeasurable. The part that's really neat, Ryan, that you touch on is that we have a very unique culture that we're really quite proud of at Cengage is that we say that we are a company of learners built for learners because that's what we provide. We fundamentally believe at our core that we're a purpose-built company that says learning anything should not be a privilege for a few. It should be something that's for everyone. And how better to enforce that than by actually doing this. So you have people that are walking the hallways that are living and breathing examples of what we actually believe at the core of the company. The part that's been really, really interesting for me is that as we brought on apprentices in this format, the format we're in right now, is that they've never walked into our whiz bang, beautiful seaport office in Boston. They've never even seen the inside of it. They've only seen each other through the lens you're seeing us now. And yet we're seeing the same exact results. We're seeing the same exact dedication and commitment out of these folks that I saw from the very first apprentices we had and had later converted into employees. So I'm a huge fan about it, but I think that there's a, there's a part of this that I would encourage each of you to consider for that reason alone is that the folks that come through this program arrive prepared, willing, able, and dedicated to you for the opportunity. You don't get that every day with every person you hire. It, it, it's, it's a great point. And it's one, one point I might make a little bit on the demographics. Obviously, uh, what we're bringing in uh, to these apprenticeships are people who have the, the will and the skill to be successful in these jobs, but don't necessarily have the training and background to do it. And the US system doesn't really offer a natural uh, mechanism to do it. And the apprenticeship does provide that mechanism. And you, you take people who are generally making in the high 20s to low 30s in jobs that don't really provide for a career. And once you give them this opportunity, they're, they're making in the 70s and 80s all of a sudden uh, and have the opportunity for a career. And, and I've had more than one of them come up to me and say it was life changing uh, in, in a way that I think you, you one can imagine. Um, one thing that Lauren talked about, obviously, is the, is the new... Uh, it allows you, the apprenticeship allows you to tap new sources of talent and, and diversity, obviously, given the United States has become a much bigger topic over the last uh, few months because of some of the tragic events that we've had. Um, how, has, how has that helped both uh, for you and the company in terms of bringing diversity to the technical teams, which, as you and I know, who've been in technical world for a long time, don't tend to be the most diverse place in the world. Yeah, it is. It's really been interesting because I think we're serious about diversity and inclusion at Cengage, but it's hard to do. And it's really hard to do here in the US more so than in other parts of the world because you can't be very specific about the type of people you wanna recruit for. What this has provided is a pool of talent that we just didn't have visibility to before. And so, and I think as Lauren called out, it's it's not just underrepresented females, people of color, et cetera, is that when I think about our first two apprentices, Kathleen was a stay at home mom. She had stopped working 20 years ago. And then Ariane who joined him was some young gentleman in his twenties that worked at the Amazon warehouse. They couldn't have been more diverse and who they were, their backgrounds, their experiences and their capabilities. Um, but yet they both came through this program. So the neat part about this program is that you get this pool of talent 
that you just wouldn't have access to that you literally get to pick from and decide who do you want to invest in in their future and your future with them. Um, I, I'm, like I said, I'm a huge fan of the program and it does you give you that diversity inclusion that every company should be doing and now realizes they're, it's a necessity. It's something we all should be doing. Great, thank you. So one last question before we maybe open the floor to folks is, uh, if you're a CIO somewhere or a technical leader and you're thinking about uh, you know, an apprenticeship program, you know, is there, what advice would you give that person uh, as they consider uh, potentially you know, signing up for a program and giving it a try? I think it, it really is a no-brainer, Reiner, is that I think it, there's not a technical leader here, I think, that shouldn't consider this and really ask the question about what's the downside? What's, what's the downside of investing your time, effort, and energy for this and the results that you could benefit? And then really think about the benefits that you could gain from this for all the reasons that we talked about, just the, the complete appreciation, the level of talent, how qualified and prepared they are, how willing and excited they are to be part of where they're becoming. There's really not, I've not found a better program in the state, and again, as Reiner pointed out, this is not the first time I've done this job, is that it's, I've not found anything like this that allows you to find an incredible talented pool of people that are willing, able, capable, and ready to join your team. I, I don't know how anybody would not want to put some effort and energy behind this. And yes, of course, like anything, yes, it's going to require you to send a couple of emails. Yes, you're going to have to have a conversation with somebody. I promise you, from my point of view, as someone who's lived through this now, it is worth every email times 10. The only thing I wish I had done, Reiner, is I wish that I had 25 apprentices, not just eight. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Jim. I really, really appreciate uh, that perspective. Um, Emily, do you want to um, pose some of the questions? Or I, I see the chat here, too. I can pick up one or two. Do you, how do you want me to handle that? Yeah, I think if you actually have um, access to the chat, you 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 may as well um, go ahead and um, follow those questions. Perfect. So the first question, and Jim alluded to this actually uh, a little bit, is is uh, a fear that um, apprentices who you sign up, once you've educated and trained them and get them gotten them comfortable, uh, they will go to another employer for a few bucks more. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll start, speak from a program perspective briefly about this and then maybe let Jim comment on it um, and, and Lauren if they want to add to it. But uh, there, we have not seen that uh, happen. In fact, uh, you know, the program overall, if you take it on a national level, is only uh, five years old now. And so there are some limits to the day that we have, obviously. Uh, but the general experience has been that people who come through the apprenticeship program are quite loyal. Uh, there are two things and much more loyal than, uh, than other employees. Uh, the two things that seem to drive that is one, the sense of loyalty that people have and gratefulness for the opportunity that Jim described earlier, which uh, translates not just into enthusiasm, uh, but in, into loyalty. And the second thing, perhaps somewhat differently, is you know, the people who, who come out of more traditional pathways have a sense of entitlement and a sense of belief that they can be, you know, any employer would be lucky to have them. Uh, and I think the people who come to this program are much more like, hey, wait a minute, I've just done this new thing. I'm with this new employer. It's working. You know, this is no time to, to, to do risky things and go somewhere else, right? Let's, let's, you know, do the thing that's working for me right now and stick with it. And so the combination of loyalty and, and the belief that you don't want to try something new when this new thing is just working so great has generally led to much higher um, uh, you know, retention rates than you would expect from other employees. So I don't know, Jim or Lauren, you want to add to, add to that comment? Yeah, I, I would agree, Reiner. I mean, I think that loyalty is a big part of it from what we've seen so far. And the other part for me is I do see this as a feeder program, and I do see that there's opportunities for these folks to grow at Cengage today. And I'm hoping that many of them will fulfill that need over time. But I see this as the opportunity for them to grow within. I'm also not naive enough to believe that these folks are really talented. And if there's a day where I don't have opportunities for them, I would love to think that the work they had done with us has helped prepare them for the future. So for me, the program 
absolutely is about helping Cengage and helping me and helping the GTS team. But if in five years or six years or 10 years or whatever it is, for me to see Ariane, Samari, Atani, see these folks in different programs, different companies doing different things, I would be thrilled. And I would be happy to think that we were part of it. Yeah, great. Um, another question is, is it um, available in uh, Connecticut? So, so Apprenti is not set up today in, in Connecticut. Um, and uh, now, and the, the subsidies that Lauren talked about would only be available for uh, employees based in Massachusetts. That being said, we do have some Connecticut based companies who have offices in Massachusetts who take advantage of the program in that way. Um, and I don't know, Lauren, if there would be restrictions to someone who wanted to run through their education in Massachusetts and then get employed in Connecticut. They, of course, wouldn't get the Mass State um, uh, financial support, but, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think the easiest answer to that is um, we are a growing organization and we really are growing with employer demand and interest. And so while we're not set up um, in Connecticut yet, um, we are uh, registered with the U.S. Department of Labor, and we are able to deliver apprenticeship across the country. And so if there is um, an interest, it's worth a conversation um, to see how we may be able to um, learn more about the needs that are um, with your company, um, Olger, or um, what you may see um, in the ecosystem in Connecticut. And um, to Reiner's point, we do have employers that have a presence in Connecticut. And so um, it's very possible that some conversations could lead to something down the road. So the next question was, uh, you know, in Germany, the apprenticeships often start at the end of 10th grade, which is the typical way that the system works. Uh, and therefore parents have a huge role to play. And so how does that work here versus college? A great question because it actually gets to a bit of the demographics of the people who tend to go through the apprenticeship system here. Be going, through the apprenticeship, uh, going through the apprenticeship we described is not something that's easy. Uh, you have to go through three to five months of very intense training uh, with homework every day, tests every week. Uh, you know, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, and then, of course, you go on to a job uh, where you also do some very intensive, intensive work. Uh, people who have in the United States, given its current cultural context, uh, people who have that kind of, I'll call it stick to and ability to work hard in the United States, given the cultural context, will probably try college. Uh, and, and as a result, the uh, folks who go through our apprenticeship, although anyone who has a high school degree is welcome to do so, tend to be in their late 20s and early 30s. Uh, these are people who uh, have, as Lauren puts it, the attitude and aptitude to be very successful, but for whatever reason in their early 20s and late teens did not end up in, in the right kind of educational context that allows them to be successful in a, in a tech job. And then they kind of get to the late 20s, early 30s and realize they're not progressing in their career in the way they'd like to. Uh, sometimes they've now matured to the point where they can engage in something with uh, this kind of uh, commitment. Uh, and so they come to us in that context. You know, these are people who are saying, hey, wait a minute, this is where I'm career-wise. Fast forward 10 years, I'm gonna be in my 40s. I, I don't like that picture, I need to, need to make a move. And those are the people we get. And so there's a, they're very motivated people. As I said, they have the attitude and aptitude to be successful in college, but for whatever reason, it did not work out for them back uh, you know, a decade earlier. Uh, and the other good thing about this is many of them have a decade of work experience. So as a result, they, they have kind of the soft skills uh, that are necessary to be uh, very successful uh, in a work environment. I know again, Lauren or Jim, if either of you wanna add something to this. Yeah, I think just um, it's a little more objectively. So some of the program requirements includes that the individuals are 18 years or older to apply, um, has a high school degree or equivalent and um, is registered to work in the United States during the duration of their apprenticeship. And I think to Reiner's point, um, nationally, as well as what we're seeing here locally, um, now being in Massachusetts for over a year and a half, um, on average, the apprentices are around 33, 34 years old. And I think our smallest percentage of um, apprentices 
in Massachusetts is that 18 to 21 year old um, age bracket. Um, we see a number of individuals that pursue apprentice who were unemployed and, and certainly underemployed because they didn't have the tech skills. Um, and so it really pre presents that um, opportunity to um, accelerate their training and, and I think as company, as individuals are thinking about ways to get gainfully employed or to pivot within their career or to re-enter their workforce, um, or even just to get into a more stable career path, uh, they see the benefits as uh, I think Jim helped to illustrate um, in, in pursuing a career uh, via an apprenticeship. Great, thank you. Um, the other question was how scalable is this program? That, that is a great question and, and it is something uh, that we think about a lot. Uh, the state's aspiration is to bring apprenticeships on par with college as a, uh, as a pathway that students would take, not just uh, mid-career as we're seeing in the early 30s, but also something that they would do directly out of high school. Um, that will take some time uh, because it requires cultural change. Uh, but that is in many ways the aspiration here because, um, you know, while around, uh, you, know, you know, almost half the people start college in the United States, uh, a much, much smaller percentage actually finish it. Uh, and as we all also know, the financial system uh, in terms of supporting people going into college in the United States is not nearly as attractive as it is in Europe and in Germany in particular. And so providing these pathways at a scalable uh, level is something that the state uh, has as its long-term commitment, but it'll take some time because of the cultural changes required. Um, I have next... a, I actually, oh, sorry, Emily, please yeah. go ahead. I actually had a question, and, and I think that Lauren addressed that, but, um, you know, one big part of the German model is, of course, that there is sort of a certification and um, a widely accepted certification at the end of that. And I think you alluded to that, that, you know, some come out with some type of um, certification that is sort of recognized um, either for other companies or generally understood as, yes, you know, that person has, you know, accomplished, you know, that and that. That is part of the program, right? Correct. So um, upon completing apprenticeship, um, the apprenticeship, including technical training and the on-the-job training, um, we're measuring to make sure that they have gained the competency. And so the employers help to measure that performance. They complete the apprenticeship receiving um, certificates um, issued by Apprenti as well as the U.S. Department of Labor. And it's meant to provide that uh, journey worker certification like we see in other industries here in Massachusetts or Massachusetts as well as the country um, like a plumber uh, or a carpenter and iron worker becoming a journey worker in their field and recognized and going to any job site to do that work um, likewise and as Reiner said as we grow it will be more accepted um, but the cert certification is meant to illustrate and, and, uh, and demonstrate that they have gained um, that apprenticeship skill and are now competent as a journey worker in their occupation. All right, there's, I saw one more question that hopefully, I think it has to be the last one just so we respect time. Mm -hmm. So I'll answer that and then hand the floor back, uh, back to Emily. So the, uh, the question is how many apprentices uh, enter the program each year? This particular program that was last year in Massachusetts in its first year. Uh, we did uh, around 40 apprentices uh, last year in, in, in the first year that, uh, that we had the program that Lauren was in charge. She started in uh, January and, and uh, had a very successful 2019. Uh, and then, you know, we hope to, hope to grow from there. In terms of apprenticeships overall outside of the building trades, so in, in more white collar positions for the state, um, last year uh, we did around 400 or 500. So it's still uh, very new. Um, but but hopefully something that we um, we will scale over time again both as we put the uh, cultural infrastructure as well as the inf institutional infrastructure in place uh, to to allow it to grow. I think just to add to that, um, since we do have a national footprint, um, there's nearly 900 apprentices um, across the markets that we serve. Um, so we hope to continue to grow those numbers in each of our markets, and of course, I'd love to see that happen here in Massachusetts. Right. Emily, let me hand the floor back to you. 
Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to all three of you, um, Jim Chilton at Cengage, wonderful insight into how the program works, which um, certainly is a little different from some of those attendees today I know who joined um, with, you know, a German background and exactly asked those questions um, in terms of age, for example, um, since the programs in Germany do, you know, work a little differently. But we're excited that you were able to present this. Um, we will definitely share with um, all those who um, registered for today some contact information, Laura, and I would um, provide your contact information if um, people have some follow-up questions or are interested to learn, learn more about um, the program. So thank you very much. I will quickly um, definitely um, to um, share with you um, two upcoming programs um, from the GABC. Um, one is actually on September 30th. Um, we will open that next week. It's a speed networking event that is sponsored by the Consul General um, of Germany here in Boston and which we're putting together with actually a couple of chambers and innovation centers. So the list you're seeing here of the um, collaborating organizations is actually not complete yet. Um, it's a speed networking event that is going through a platform where you are actually in charge of inviting or being invited um, to um, a 12 minute one on one um, video session. So we think it's a great new opportunity, of course, in this virtual world to connect with other business people. Um, we also are launching, we were supposed to have our economic German American Economic Forum on Smart Cities on November 6th um, at Northeastern University. And of course, we cannot do that in the way we were supposed to. Um, so we're launching a series of um, virtual events with the hopes of actually having our big forum in person um, next spring. And the first event is going to be on October 16th um, with Rick Dimino, um, the CEO of A Better City and the general manager of Siemens Smart Infrastructure here um, in the New England area, as well as a representative from Turner Construction. And again, that's going into um, the new world that we're living in, in terms of working buildings, pandemic, um, remote, not remote, um, and being smart. So um, thank you to all our attendees today, um, most importantly to our speakers making time. I hope that everyone um, took something away from today and we will be following up with um, an upload of the video for those who may have come in a little late um, today or may have dropped off a little earlier. So thank you to Jim, Ina, Lauren, it was a pleasure and uh, we will be in touch.